Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, magnificent, and beautiful word. We thank you for how it gives life. Thank you that we can trust it wholeheartedly. Thank you for the guide and direction that you provide us through it. And I pray that your people would be challenged, comforted, encouraged today. I also pray for any soul in this room that is still dead in sins and trespasses, that you would grant them eyes to see the glory of Jesus. They would see the heinousness of their own sin. They would grant them repentance and faith that they would turn from sin to Christ and be rescued. Lord, we, we pray that a passage like this here in Romans 8 would, would do all the things that you have intended for it to accomplish within our hearts and souls. We pray all this rebounds to your glory, to the advancement of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Karl Marx infamously claimed that religion is the opiate of the masses. By this, Marx meant to indicate that religion was kind of in conflict with what he thought should happen within the world because it offered comfort to oppressed people by which perhaps their desire to find emancipation or freedom from power structures that were over them, that were holding them down and were suppressing them. He felt that the comfort that they received from religious enterprise uh, was delaying them from doing what should be inevitably the case otherwise, and that is to overthrow their oppressors and push forward a revolution. He claimed that religion stood in the way of true revolution, the true betterment for the common man, that the common man is being deceived about what's really best for him by those within religious enterprise. Others have made similar sorts of claims about religious pursuits, although maybe for different reasons. Some have pointed to the church as merely an escape for people who don't want to deal with their own problems. That it's an escape for people who are trying to find a way to ignore real life. Some view church service as a way to just make people feel better, a little happier, uh, to forget about their hardships, to make them feel just a little bitter, better about life. It's interesting, um, almost 100 years ago, maybe like 75 years ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones explains what happens when people who have imbibed that idea about what church is supposed to all be about, what happens when that kind of person walks through the door of a genuine church that's actually doing what it's supposed to do on a Sunday morning. And he says this, all they want is a ministry of comfort, a pleasing, soothing atmosphere. They want a bright service, a spice of entertainment, something to help them, something to soothe and comfort them. And suddenly, they're confronted by a man standing in the pulpit who preaches about a holy God who hates sin and who is full of wrath against sin. And they say to themselves, things were bad enough already. This guy's making it worse. I wanted some comfort. It's interesting that Lloyd-Jones is, is saying that back in the mid to, to uh, late 1900s. And we can see how that misunderstanding of the church has gone much, much further into our present day. These false perspectives of church manifest the world's inability to understand what the gospel actually is. And we shouldn't be all that surprised by this because we know from Scripture that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the eyes and the minds of, of the unbelieving that they might not see the glory of Christ, that they might not understand the gospel. And so it shouldn't be that surprising that they misinterpret what is Christian teaching and Christian living. Although it might also be the case, sadly, as we noted last week, that some of the world's impression or understandings, uh, thoughts about what Christianity is, has been misinformed by false teachers who promulgate messages like the ones they think the church is all about, especially those things like health and wealth prosperity gospels. Those charlatans have not only obscured the genuine gospel, but their actions have led to the disenfranchisement of many, of countless multitudes, because they've been given false promises that are built on false hopes, empty hopes, leading 
ultimately to doubt and depression and disillusionment with what they thought now is Christianity, when in reality they were given something quite different. Last week we completed the first major section of Romans 8 as we came to the end of verse 17 and we read, if indeed we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified with him. And we noted last time together that suffering is not an unusual circumstance for Christians, but rather the norm. And therefore, we ought not be surprised by fiery ordeals when they come around us. See 1 Peter 4.12. Not only do we all know pain and heartache and troubles in actual experience, but the scriptures themselves nowhere promise a lessening of those sufferings this side of glory. In fact, if anything, God's word guarantees added suffering. Why? Because Christians not only experience the suffering that is common to man due to the fall and the entrance of sin generally, but they also experience the unique suffering that is, that is theirs precisely because they follow Jesus Christ. They are treated just as their Lord and Savior was treated. This world hated Jesus, and so this world hates devout followers of Christ. Jesus went to great lengths to prepare his disciples for that reality. And the apostles, as we saw last time, in turn prepared the church for that same rejection by the world. And here the church is, many generations later, experiencing the same tribulations and hardships and troubles and persecutions. So anyone who says that people flee to the church in order to ignore or lessen their troubles is sorely mistaken. The Bible plainly declares in this life that we will have trouble. See Jesus' words in John 16, 33. You don't run to Jesus in order to squash further suffering in this life or to escape from the troubles of this life. Rather, those who are in Christ flee to him because they recognize one exceedingly crucial, primary, central truth, and that is this. Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. That's why we flee to Jesus. Only in Christ can our sins be forgiven. That's why we go to Jesus. Only in Christ is the wrath of God taken away from our account. Only in Christ can we be adopted into God's family. Can we be called God's sons and promised an eternal inheritance? Sinners run to the church not to escape earthly trials, but to be rescued from the coming day of judgment when the one true holy God executes his perfect judgment against all those who have rebelled against him who are not found in Christ. Only those found in Christ will be rescued from the great white throne judgment and the gospel makes no promises of safety from earthly harm or safety from financial poverty or physical sickness or relational struggle or natural disasters or political upheaval or horrific war or deathly disease or crippling disability. There's no promises of those things that we won't see any of those things or any other general suffering for that matter or hardship. But it does promise this that we saw at the beginning of Romans 8. There will therefore be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is what makes us run to Christ. This is what we're after. This is why we're here. And if you walked in this morning unsuspecting, thinking, well, maybe somebody will give me a nice little pep talk today. I'll feel a little bit better about my life. Here's the talk I had to give with you. If you came for a little pep talk, you came to the wrong place. But if you came to hear the words of eternal life, if you came to find a place where your sins could be forgiven, if you came to find someone who could save you from your ultimate problem, then you did come to the right place. Last week we saw how clear the scriptures are on the theme of suffering. This is not a seldom addressed subject with one or two obscure references, but rather a widely addressed matter in a multitude of texts. I think I spent a little unusual sermon from me last week. I think we did like a survey of the New Testament and a whole bunch of texts on sufferings. This is because Christian suffering is itself a mark of authenticity of the Christian faith. It's the very setting in which a believer's trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is lived out. This is where the rubber meets the road. It is through testings and trials and the troubles of this life that a Christian's walk with and in Christ is made manifest. So rather than doubting where we are in relationship with the Lord when troubles come, we should let that anchor hold all the more. This is where I find my security. This is where I have my hope. It's found in Christ and in Christ alone. 
And not only that, but we talked about last time that suffering is in itself the road to glory. Just as Jesus' path to glory was through many hardships and trials and sufferings, so our following him necessarily involves persecution and pain. If you want to enjoy life with Christ in the resurrection, then you'll also enjoy life with Christ in sufferings and pain and tribulation. We must not forget this. And so suffering doesn't ultimately discourage Christians because, number one, it manifests the fact that we are genuinely the people of God. That's why we're experiencing suffering, especially if it's Christian suffering, precisely for our stand for Christ, for all those who desire, desire to live godly will suffer persecution. So if it's for that reason, be encouraged, dear brother or sister. It's a mark of authenticity that you are a child of God. But also, it reminds us that this is the path to glory. Partaking in the sufferings of Christ in the present means the assurance that you'll partake with Christ in the glories of his resurrection. These are connected. So now we come to verse 18. And we begin a new section. One that we're going to entitle Groanings and Glory. And my, my plan here is to kind of have a multi-part series with that title, Groanings and Glory. Ultimately, I believe that Romans 8:18 8, through verse 30 directs our attention to the coming glory. That's where this is after. This is what this text is, is about. Glory serves as bookends to this section. Look at it in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And then look at verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice the word glory it happens probably only three times in this text, but it is the bookends to this section. It's what this section is ultimately about. And in between glory, we have verse 22, verse 23, and verse 26. Three times we see the word groaning. We see glory and groaning. The point of this section is this. Paul was providing a further explanation of how it is possible for Christians to live in light of future glory while in the midst of very real groaning. How do we live in light of future glory while in the midst of very real groaning? And we'll note these in turn, right? Creation groans, we groan, the Holy Spirit groans. We'll see all of those groanings in this text, but it's all buttressed with the idea of glory. Glory at the beginning, glory at the end. It's all about glory, and yet there's very real groaning. You see, what this world misinterprets as Christians ignoring troubles is in reality Christians viewing troubles in light of all they are and have been given in Christ Jesus. You see, why they think Christians are just ignoring them is because they don't know what we have. They don't know what we've been given. They don't know who we are. The road is hard. We can say it this way, impossible on your own. But the good news as Christians is we have not been left alone. And the further good news is that suffering does not have the final word. Yes, we will groan, but groaning will be swallowed up in glory. So in part one, groanings in glory, I want to note two reckonings, two, we can say thought processes or two exercises in reason that Christians make, which proves this, it proves that we're neither pie-in-the-sky idealists who fail to deal with reality, so we're not that. We're not just saying, well, those troubles don't actually exist. No, they are real, and they do exist, and they're real groanings, and in no way are we trying to lessen the severity and the hardship that is facing Christians. But on the other hand, we are not mere materialists who lack any framework by which to consider suffering in the present and that it has some sort of meaning and purpose in light of a coming day of glory. You've got to keep both of those together. Suffering is real, and yet suffering has to be considered in light of future glory. This involves two important sets of reasoning. The one is we have to make a careful consideration of time, and the second one is we have to make a very important comparison of worth. Those are the two things we're going to look at together. First of all, a consideration of time. The present in light of the future. The present in light of the future. And we have to begin with 
describing the now. You know, the present is that which is happening right now. Present is one of those weird things to think about, isn't it? Because the moment you think about present, now in your thinking about the word present, present's already passed, right? The word I just said, present, is already passed by the time I'm thinking then, reflecting upon it. And meanwhile, so the past are those moments which we've already experienced. The future are those moments that we have yet to experience. And the present is this very, very thin line separating past from future, in which the future becomes the past through the present. If you've ever done any video editing, you get to see an entire timeline below the viewing window, and you can kind of scrub forward and backward. It's kind of a weird experience, actually, to watch words spoken backwards and all the rest and watch actions backwards. But you kind of scrub through there and you got this little line which is showing you what the viewing window is showing at that particular time. But you can kind of scrub forwards and backwards as you kind of look at both past and present in reference to that line. The now can be likened to a thin line through which the future is realized and be immediately becomes the past. But here in Romans 8.18, the now, the present, the present age, the now time, is a reference not to just this exact moment, but all of the days from Jesus' death and resurrection until his glorious return, his second coming. The Bible describes this as, in other places, as the last days. We're living in the last days because we're awaiting the blessed return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the consummation of history. This reminds us that sufferings have a time stamp. Look at it with me, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings of the now, the sufferings of the present, they have a limited duration. Now, certainly this doesn't mean that they are not significant or the time of pain might not be excruciating or even horrific at times. Just that the things happening in the present age, in the now, are not forever. There is some solace in knowing that this is not how it always will be. But this is only a comfort for Christians, understand what he's doing here. He's reasoning with Christians. He's reasoning with believers. He says in verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Who is the us? It's believers he's talking to. He says there's a thought process believers go through. There's a reckoning that happens within our minds. And we consider, when we consider sufferings, we understand they have a timestamp. They're not forever. There's an expiration date on suffering. And there is solace found in that. Understand that as Christians, here's a comforting thought. No matter how bad life is, guess what? This is the worst it will ever be for you. It could be the absolute worst thing could ever happen to you in this life, but it's the worst it will ever be for you. For the best is yet to come. This is how Paul can say in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, if living in the now is Christ, then dying is gain in the about to be revealed, in what is yet to come. For Christians to die is gain. But notice that this is not a comforting thought for sinners who are still in their sin. To die for them is loss. If living is found in anything other than Jesus, then dying is loss. If, if living is popularity, dying is loss. If living is prestige, dying is loss. If living is power, dying is loss. If living is possessions, dying is loss. Put anything else in there, dying is loss. And there are some lost sinners who say, well, I, I'm fine to just become worm food and die and cease to exist. But herein lies the problem. They will not cease to exist. The worm will not die. The fire will not be quenched. Jesus' words. They will suffer eternally in hell. And this ought to strike fear and trembling into the soul of every non-Christian. Every day that passes, every moment that goes by, brings a rebellious sinner that much closer to final judgment. And from that final judgment, as the books are open and your deeds are announced, and you receive the punishment that you are due, the wages of sin is death, eternal death, eternal punishment, in hell, without revocation, without parole. Notice the flip here. For them, this is the best it will ever be. For Christians, this is the worst it will ever be. But for non-Christians, this is the best it will ever be. So this reckoning is one that's peculiar to Christians. 
Only we who are no longer under the condemnation, under condemnation, live in the now with a view to the about to be revealed, and we have comfort and hope. For everyone else, if you're not in Christ, then Hebrews 10.27 describes your state. You're in a position of terrifying expectation of judgment. That's where you should be. And if you're not, you're trying to ignore what is very, very real. The trouble with most men is that they only account for the present age. Most of them try not to think about what happens after death. They don't want to think about what is about to be revealed, but we as Christians care deeply about that. Let's consider the about to be revealed. I'm, I'm sure we've all heard the saying before, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. The statement is usually made in reference to people whose relationship with the Lord appears to make them unsympathetic to the situation of their fellow man. This is a criticism of people who prioritize Bible study and formal worship of God without any sort of corresponding care for people around them or physical needs of people around them, and they seem to just not care about anything else or anyone else. The problem with that saying, however, is that the Bible never encourages us to think less of heaven. You show me that verse. You know, your problem is you're thinking too much of the life to come. Stop doing it. That never happens in Scripture. Scripture never says, you know, man's chief problem is he thinks too much of the life to come. It never says that. Instead, it's the opposite. You need to think about what's to come. Not think just here so, so myopically, but think about the bigger picture. The Bible's prescription is that we must maintain a heavenly mindedness if we are going to be of any lasting earthly good. If you do not have a heavenly mindset, you will not be a lasting earthly good. Those who lack sympathy for their fellow man are not suffering from too much heavenly mindedness because I would say this, if that person's mind was really set on the things above, then they would be living in the present in light of eternity and they would consider people the way God considers them. They would begin to care about them. They would be concerned about the state of their souls. You see, if your heart is set on the things of God, then the things of God will be what you treasure. And the things that you treasure will be what you pursue. And you'll seek and find those things. And as you seek and find those things, you'll be drawn ever more to the Lord himself. The things that God loves, you will love. If you love the Lord, you will love his church. Imperfect as we are, troubled as we are, you will love his bride because Jesus loves his bride. You will love the lost because Jesus loves the lost. You'll care about the troubled and the hurting and the orphans and the widows and the downcast in the mourning because Jesus cares about the poor and the hurting and the orphans and the widows and the downcast and the mourning and the troubled and the hurting. When you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you will also Fulfill the second commandment. You will love those who are his, made in his image, his image bearers. And you will be earthly good precisely because you are heavenly minded. You will give with this mindset. You will work with this mindset. You will love with this mindset. You will serve with this mindset and dream with this mindset and talk with this mindset and instruct others with this mindset and help with this mindset. It is this mindset that occupies the Christian that while he recognizes he lives in the now, his mind is always with the future in mind because he knows this reality. The present age is not all there is. There's the crucial moment. If this is all there is, it makes sense to circumscribe your life by this. But if this is temporary and what is to come is eternal, how dare you think only in terms of this when there's that to come? Christianity is able to distinguish the present from the future. The present is always viewed in light of what is to be revealed. And I love the way that's described here, the about to be revealed. The about to be revealed. It's not so much a matter of what God will make reality and be created in the future, but the way it's described here is as if it's already certain, just about to be revealed. It's like going to a play, right? And there's no way that the moment you show up for the play, all the preparations begin. You'll be waiting a long time, right? They've been practicing and planning and setting it all up and the curtain might be drawn right but then the curtain pulls back and we are immediately see what has been done what has been prepared what is real behind the curtain in a similar way so is the future already secure we live in the already not yet the kingdom of god is real and true 
and yet its fulfillment, its revelation is not fully yet here. But it is absolutely certain, and this changes everything. This is why Titus 2, as we had read just a few moments ago in verse 13, says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Note here, he already is and always has been. He is glorious. What we're awaiting is the appearing of that glory, the manifestation, the revelation of that glory. So this first reckoning that we make as Christians is we consider the time and we, we distinguish between the present and the future, the now and the about to be revealed. But there's a second reckoning we need to do. This is point two. The second reckoning, and it has to do with a comparison of worth. A comparison of worth. Verse 18 again. For I consider, I reckon, I think, I reason, that the sufferings of this present time, so this is the present time, are not to be worthy to compare to the glory that is to be revealed. So present versus to be revealed. Notice also the other part of this is the sufferings of the present, of the now, are not worthy to be compared. The Greek doesn't have that phrase to be compared. It's understood as part of the context here. It reads like literally sufferings of this present time not worthy with glory to be revealed to us or in us. There's a comparison of worth here. There's suffering in light of glory. We compare the worth of suffering in the now with the glory that is to be revealed. So let's take a moment to consider the suffering. Certainly the, the now, the present age, is one of suffering. The Bible honestly declares that. Our experience obviously manifests that. But that is not the way it was originally, nor is it the way it will be for everyone forever. Suffering was not an element in the original creation. God made all things in six literal days and said that it was very good. There was a time, however brief it might have lasted, in which Adam and Eve enjoyed a world without suffering, pain, or death. By the way, side note, Another reason why, besides that it's just patently unscientific, evolution is just junk. In order to be a theistic evolutionist, you have to believe that there was cycles and millions of years of death before there was sin. That's a huge problem. Death is a result of sin. And the creation itself, as we'll see in coming weeks, is under groaning because of sin, because of man's fall in the Garden of Eden. It's had implication on the entire creation. There was a time, though, before the fall in which Adam and Eve enjoyed a world without suffering, pain, and death, which they enjoyed perfect relationship with one another, perfect communion with, with God in the Garden of Eden. But all of that changed when Adam and Eve took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and ate from its fruit in disobedience to God's command. And at that moment, the entire world changed. In fulfillment of the consequence that God said would happen should they disobey him, Adam and Eve experienced death. It happened in an immediate sense spiritually where they were separated from God and kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And it happened physically as well as death would eventually overtake them physically as well. The world we're living in, in the present, in the now, is this combination of the result of God's good creative design. And we still see God's good creative design in the world around us. There are elements within the world that just manifestly make obvious God's power and design and creativity and beauty and glory. And yet in, that, in this same world, we also see the result of God's judgment on sin due to the fall of man seen in man's rebellion against God. And so this world is a mixture of good and evil, of truth and lies, of beauty and corruption. This world bears the marks of a good creator God who upholds and sustains all things. And yet that world has been marred by sin, manifest in a variety of natural evils as well as moral evils, many of which all of humanity experiences. And then some of that evil is particularly an evil that only Christians experience precisely because they follow Jesus and the world hates him and so they, therefore they, they hate us as well. So the fact of suffering is evident. Man need go no further than his own experience 
Everyone in this room, I'm sure, has had some share in suffering. And it could be different gradations of suffering. You might have had a particularly heavy amount of suffering versus somebody else who maybe has a little bit lighter load. But all of us have suffered. No one is exempt from it. The quality of suffering, the quantity of suffering might vary from person to person. It does vary from person to person. But we're all experiencers of suffering. And suffering as a result of its just existence within the world has prompted a lot of people to, to argue that suffering itself, the existence of suffering itself, speaks against the idea that there could be a God. Especially if that God is good. Especially if the God is all-powerful. I mean, if he's not good, then it makes sense. I mean, an evil God just makes people suffer. If God's good, but he's not all-powerful, that also could be sense. Like, he wants to do something, he's just, his hands are tied. He's not able to do anything. But if you have the Christian concept of God that he's all powerful and he's all good, then how can suffering exist? This has caused many, especially atheists, to, they call it the problem of evil, sometimes referred to as theodicy, try to argue against God's existence just by the sheer nature that there is evil. That, that, that question, by the way, has kind of morphed and changed over the years. Some would argue that it's not just the existence of evil, but the particular heinousness of evil. Like, it's just too much evil. Like, I can see some evil being present maybe, but there's just too much evil that, that there could be an actual loving, all-powerful God who exists. And while I do not claim to be able to answer why any particular hardship or particular trial befalls a particular person... I can say that suffering and hardship has meaning in the Christian worldview. You see, the problem of evil is only a problem if you can point out evil as being evil. Trek with me for here for just a minute. In order to do that, you have to make some sort of moral judgment that things are not the way they ought to be. In order for you to call your present circumstance to be a, one of suffering or hardship or trial or difficulty or, you know, unwanted or unfair, you have to as ascribe to some sort of idea of oughtness. Like, things ought to be a certain way, but they're not. Like, I've, got, I've been given an unfair shake of things. Where does that come from? You see, the problem for the atheist is if there is no God, then suffering is meaningless. Why? Well, because in order to have an idea that things aren't the way they should be, you have to have some sort of sense of should be. But without God, without a creator, without a moral lawgiver, you have no ground for declaring something good or bad, something right or wrong. Your right or wrong is just as good as somebody else's right or wrong. It's all relative. And therefore, suffering itself then loses definition and meaning. Well, you have to ask the question of the atheist, why do you think suffering is bad? Why should pain be avoided? Who's to say that that's evil? Maybe those evil things are actually good things. Who's to say? And why become upset about it? Why think that you've been given an unfair deal? All those questions only make sense if you're trying to make sense of suffering. But trying to find meaning or purpose in suffering is something you cannot do if there's not a God. Suffering itself is meaningless. And you're caught in a trap. Because deep down inside the human heart, we know suffering's real. And we don't like it. <laughs> And we look around us and we go, there's bad things. It's amazing. We live in a world, right, that wants to make everything relative. But certain things happen on the world stage and you hear moral judgments coming from people who say there is no God. We're, and they're not just appealing because I just think it's wrong. They believe everyone should think it's wrong. Why? Where is that coming from? See, part of the problem for the atheist when he starts questioning whether or not God exists at all by the pressure of the suffering, my question back to him is, why do you think suffering is wrong? What's, what's, where's the oughtness? How are you getting your feeling that suffering shouldn't happen? You see, I have a context for that. I can say to you, you're right. The world isn't the way God originally made it. And guess what? The good news is it won't be this way forever. God is still at work. And while I can't explain a particular suffering in your particular life, we can say in a general way, suffering is a result of sin. Suffering is a result of a fallen world. And God does amazing things through suffering. We'll talk about it in a little bit. We'll have time to talk about that over the coming weeks. There's purposes that God has. But that whole idea of purpose only matters if there's a God. Otherwise, suffering is meaningless. And everything you suffer is completely pointless. 
The pursuit for ultimate purpose in suffering is utterly in vain if there is no God, if there is no creator, if there is no author, no sustainer, no sovereign. Daniel Doriani says it well. If there is no creator, no redeemer, no plan, no purpose, then there is no ideal state from which the universe has fallen, no hope of future restoration, and suffering is in fact not a problem. See what he's saying? It shouldn't be a problem to you. What's the problem? The only hope that suffering has meaning and purpose, even if we fail to fully understand that purpose. And dear friends, there's a whole lot of those circumstances, right? Let's all be honest. We can say the general, we can say the general statement, but when you yourself are facing a tremendous amount of suffering, a tremendous loss, a tremendous moment of bereavement or sickness or disease or disability, it is hard. There's nothing easy about it. But you don't help somebody by saying, well, there is no God and this is just all. Then what is my suffering for? What does this all mean? Nothing means anything. The only hope that suffering has meaning and purpose is for there to be a God who is working in and through all of it to bring about his purposes. And for the things that happen in this life to have implication beyond the now a future result from present suffering, that there's some grand purpose even in the midst of the hardest stuff I go through. If there is no to be revealed, if there is no future, then there is no meaning to the present. Why this? If it makes no difference into eternity. Verse 18 explains the sort of reckoning Christians are involved in. We consider the sufferings of the now age are not worthy in comparison with the glory to be revealed. So let's take just a moment to compare present suffering with future glory. Let's consider the glory together. Again, as we saw in our consideration of time here too is a comparison that only Christians can make. If you're not a Christian, this is something you can't engage in. John MacArthur said, those who live only for this life cannot look forward to any resolution of wrongs or to any comfort for their souls. Their pain, loneliness, and afflictions serve no distinct purpose and bring no divine reward. Christians, on the other hand, have great hope, not only that their afflictions eventually will end, but that those afflictions actually will be add to their eternal glory. There it is. Not just that there's a time stamp on suffering, but that God is going to use the sufferings you've encountered for future glory. There'll be glory found through your suffering, right? So your suffering is not only something we grin and bear and make it through, but we see it as part of the road to glory and part of what we will be glorified in as a result. We've already mentioned that suffering is limited, but by contrast, it's not only, and by contrast, that glory will be unlimited in duration, Believers are given eternal life, an eternal inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I love that in 1 Peter 1. Like how much more clear you get? This is really, 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 really yours. Triple signed, double underlined, bold, italicized. This is yours, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven, an eternal inheritance. And not only will the duration of the glory be longer than the time-stamped suffering, but the quality of the glory will far exceed the quality of suffering we've encountered. The heinousness of the suffering that we've experienced will be far exceeded by the quality of rewards of glory that are to come. See, this is what Marx doesn't get. This is not escapism. This is understanding the world as it really is. God is Lord. God is sovereign. He'll make things right. He's the one bringing justice. And he will, make, he will reward those who have suffered for him. This isn't a haphazard assessment either. The reason why we had read uh, 2 Corinthians this morning, Paul gives us a, a little list of things that he went through. You know, Paul was living, I, I don't you understand this, like some people say like, oh, Paul's such a braggart. You understand, in, especially in those days, like, and this is still true today. Like if somebody says, you know, somebody's going to come up and speak and they go like, hey, but before this guy comes, I just want you to know, this guy's been through a lot of horrible stuff. I just want you to know that. Okay, come on, come on, come and speak. Like, we want to hear his accolades. Like how many degrees does he have? How much money has he made? That kind of stuff, right? Paul instead says, well, you want to hear about my apostolic credentials? I was in far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times received from the Jews, 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, stoned once, three times shipwrecked, night and a day spent in the deep, 
frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers from false brethren. Been in labor, hardship, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, without food, cold, and exposure. And he gets out of all of that, and he says, and apart from all those external things, the whole time I've been concerned about the church. If someone in pain in the church, I feel it deeply. I want you to remember that this is the guy who says the sufferings of the now are not worthy to be compared with the glory to follow. Now, maybe somebody in here can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to make a hazard a guess. You have not been through that. Now, you might have been through what you say, well, that's my, my thing, kind of, some of these things I might identify with, but I, I think we'd be hard-pressed, at least in this room, probably. If I'm wrong, then forgive me. But the point is this. This guy knew suffering. And he's able to say, it's nothing. Nothing compared with the glory that is to be revealed. And if even with all of that suffering, Paul could say that the woes of the present pale in comparison with the glory to come, then can't we too? 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is de decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction, time-stamped affliction, time-stamped suffering, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. There's the same statement, right? Notice, maybe you could say a slight difference. In, in, in verse 18, he's just making a comparison. He's like, the, the glory to come is so much greater than that. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says it's actually producing that weight of glory. The suffering you're presently encountering is producing a weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. One of the modern hymns we sing every once in a while Christ the sure and steady anchor. Here's the first and fourth verses. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Listen to the fourth verse. Christ the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory, as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Listen to that last phrase. The calm will be the better for the storms that we went through. One more thing to quickly mention here before I close. Look at how verse 18 ends to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, there's a little bit of theological discussion about that preposition right there when translated to. Some others would translate it in. Thomas Schreiner explains, the idea is that the glory apprehends us and is bestowed upon us. We are caught up by the glory and given glory. We become partakers of the glory to be revealed. God's glory in transforming the world will include us and therefore we will be glorified together with Christ. There's, there's, some, there's something here that goes just beyond comprehension, right? Lloyd-Jones said it this way. We must not think that we are merely spectators of the glory. We shall not merely have the privilege of looking on to the glory. We, will be, we are going to be partakers of the glory, sharers in the glory, involved in the glory. It's going to happen to us. It is in us. It's a glory which will be bestowed upon us and which we shall actually be partakers in. You see how this all travels through with the whole book of Romans, right? You fellowship in. In his sufferings, you are one who has partaken of his death, that you might be a partaker of his life. You have died and been buried with Christ, that you might be raised in glory with Christ. This is why Peter can describe himself in 1 Peter 5, 1, as a partaker also of the glory to be revealed. Notice that, a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. So I was putting together my conclusion I came across this statement by Doug Moo, and I realized after some amount of wordsmithing, I couldn't say it better than him, so I'm going to read what he said. He says, 
viewed from a perspective that holds this world to be a closed system, suffering is a harsh and final reality that can never be explained nor transcended. Think about that for a minute. What is he saying? He's saying, if the now is all there is, then suffering is a harsh, final reality. Its word is final. And there is no meaning, there's no purpose, and there is no transcendence. Suffering doesn't get swallowed up in something else. That's all there is. He continues, but a Christian views the suffering of this life in a larger world transcending context that while not alleviating present intensity transcends it with the confident expectation that suffering is not the final word. Let me say that again. Suffering is not the final word. Suffering is real. Christianity doesn't ignore it. In the present, following Christ means more difficulties, more trials, more hardships. If you came and came to know Jesus, and you're like, I came to Christ so that way my life would be just easy street. You came for the wrong reasons. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel isn't come to Jesus and you'll have your paycheck always to you. Come to Jesus and everything's going to go easy. Relationships are going to be piece of cake. Everyone's going to like you. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel, come to Christ and you'll have increased difficulties, increased trials, increased hardships. But it also means you will not be left alone. The Lord will uphold you. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will cause you to stand. And when the trials and troubles and tribulations of this life are over, they'll just be further fuel to the glory to come. The glories in store for God's people will eclipse the present struggle. And we can also note, if in case, this message mainly to believers in the room today, but I want to conclude with this thought for you if you are not a Christian. Suffering also can play an important role in your life if you're not a believer. It might be the very means by which you as a lost person are awakened to the dreadful reality of what's to come for you. Doriani explains, through pain and suffering, God shouted, something is wrong. Echoes from Eden declare that this is not the way life is supposed to be. And if you feel that suffering is abnormal, it nudges humanity to seek, how does it get fixed? How do we fix the abnormalcy? How do we seek redemption? Today, the world has fallen. Here's the good news. If you're lost, the world has fallen. You're in the midst of a whole bunch of sin. You have your own sin, and you've been suffered from others, the sins of other people. But here's the good news. God has not forsaken the world. It has fallen, but it has not been forsaken. God has refused to leave it a ruin. He's going to recreate it. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And the fact that people cannot shake the idea that there's something wrong with the world, just search your heart on this. If there is no God, you should have no cry, no foul. You have nothing to, 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 be, to moan about because there's no God. So how could you say it should be a different way? But if in your heart of hearts you're saying, the world isn't the way it should be. I know that. There's something wrong with this world. Here's the, here's the truth. That's true. It's right because there was a fall and sin came into it. And you're part of that whole sin system and you're enslaved to it just as I once was. Don't come to Jesus because you think he's going to make this life easier. But come to Jesus because he's your only hope of having your sins forgiven, of being given eternal life, of being made a son of God, being granted an eternal inheritance will never pass away, reserved in heaven for you. And dear Christian brothers and sisters, this is why suffering is so important in a Christian's life. This is why we're taking our time with this passage. You must have the right perspective of this because I guarantee you when the world watches Christians suffer, there is something very unique that happens. It is one of our most unique testimonies to a watching world. This world gets it when everything goes your way and you feel good. They don't get it when things don't go your way and you're still singing. They don't get it when there's a subtle joy in the midst of the pain. Yes, we're going to still cry. It's hard. Life is hard. We're not trying to gloss over that. But when the world sees you persevere because you're reckoning a couple things. Number one, the now is not forever. Number two, there's a future glory to be revealed. Number three, this suffering is nothing compared to that, that glory. And number four, this suffering is landing me with more glory. All rebounding to the glory of our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. And we thank you for the message of 
glory in the midst of groaning. Lord, help us to be faithful purveyors of this truth. We're living in a world that is suffering. It takes somebody to just absolutely like, you know, stick their head in the sand or in the mud to, to try to ignore the suffering around us. It is real. And deep within the human heart, I think it's an evidence of, of your law written on the heart. There's a, there's a feeling of oughtness and justice and that things aren't the way they ought to be. Lord, I pray that you would help people realize that they can't fix those, those wrongs ultimately, that only you could. Pray you'd grant them eyes to see the glory of Jesus, that they reach out to him and be saved. For my brothers and sisters in this room, I pray, Lord, you'd help us to encounter suffering in the right way, that we'd reckon with these ideas properly, and that we'd be able to point others to the only hope that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Proud this in his name. Amen.